Thank you so much, Melinda, also for bringing me back here. Um, I had a wonderful time here in June and July, and am therefore somewhat closer to finishing that book. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure it's forthcoming with Duke yet. That's still uh, to be addressed. Um, but anyway, thank you so much all for, for coming. Um, first thing this morning. So the day on which the former authoritarian leader of Indonesia, Suharto, made his momentous decision to step down from the presidency after more than 32 years in power, and his formal announcement of this decision early the following morning on May 21st, 1998, coincided with no less than two national holidays. The first was National Awakening Day, commemorating the birth in 1908 of the student national movements dedicated to achieving independence from Dutch colonial rule. The second, though much less widely recognized, was the ascension of Jesus Christ that in 1998 fell on May 21st. I only became aware of the second holiday as I began to write the introduction of the book on which this presentation partly draws, but in light of much that follows, it is hard not to discern some poetic truth in the concurrence of the regime's collapse and the ascent of Jesus Christ. Now in the early 2000s, at the far end of Indonesia, in the islands once renowned as a source of fragrant spices like nutmeg and cloves, Jesus appeared again and again, rising out of the ruins of the war-torn central Moluccan city of Ambon. During a brief visit to the provincial capital in 2003, still then under emergency conditions, my curiosity was piqued by the immense faces of Jesus and Christian scenes that whizzed by the car in which I rode with colleagues from a local university as it navigated the city's complicated zoning and religiously marked neighborhoods. As I came to know Ambon in its new post-war circumstances, I encountered a city crowded with such pictures. Along highways at important crossroads or facing outway, outwards from the gateways of Christian neighborhoods, Huge Jesus faces towered over the passers-by and traffic moving below, while murals showing Christian martyrdom or emblems snatched from Christmas cards like Santa Claus and bells formed brightly colored backdrops to the urban congestion of bedshock, pedicabs, motorbikes, pedestrians, minibuses, and Toyota Kijang vans. Returning to Ambon in 2005, I began my fieldwork there by pursuing the pictures, following them to different locations around the city, up into the hills where many Christians live, and into churches where arresting and unprecedented figures of Jesus had recently appeared behind some Protestant church altars. Over time, I discovered more new pictures tucked away in Christian homes whose well-to-do well owners had commissioned small painted rooms set aside for prayer, or Christian-themed walls, and most unexpectedly, an immense triptych prophesizing the apocalypse, hidden out of sight in a warehouse only a short drive outside of Ambon. During the years in which I visited and carried out fieldwork in the city, the magnitude, number, and heterogeneity of the street images never ceased to amaze me. From the tormented Jesus face with a crown of thorns and huge dark eyes upturned to heaven, on a billboard along the highway from the airport into Ambon, or another brilliantly blue-eyed billboard Christ about which many of the city's Christians never failed to comment, to scenes of Jesus surrounded by Roman soldiers stretching out on public walls, or his head hovering above an urban battlefield where tiny white-clad jihadis and national army soldiers engaged each other in fighting. Some stood out even more than others. A few indigenous Christs, but also the cameo Jesus portraits with painted serrated edges that due to their cutout appearance were called state ID photographs. There were also more regal Christs dating from a later moment, emanating authority and protection from behind altars in Ambon's Protestant churches, others elsewhere on the island or on neighboring ones. I begin today with the image, asking what it is about the image, and specifically here the image of Christ 
that moves at center stage and monumentalizes it publicly at this historical and politically fraught moment in Indonesia. What was the affective charge of these images, such that their presence in Ambon was capable of offering some solace to the city's Christians, who launched the new medium during the conflict that from mid-January 1998, 1999, engulfed the city in intermittent violence for more than three long years. The conflict left the city divided into Muslim and Christian territories, up to 10,000 persons killed, and close to 700,000 displaced, with ongoing tension and occasional outbreaks long thereafter. Beyond any signification in Ambon's war or its aftermath, these pictures in the first place were something to be seen, admired and gazed at by Christians, catching the eye, approving or otherwise of passers-by, interrupting the flow of traffic, or marshaled as a backdrop for photographs of young Christian men brandishing weapons or other poses caught on camera. Potent material presences standing on sidewalks and along streets in the wartime and post-war urban environment, these images have the capacity to move beyond any specific context, even something as dire and encompassing as the profound uncertainties and violence of war. If any image necessarily establishes its own force field, my book examines at length the various forces that coalesced around and animated these specific pictures. One such force is the sheer materiality and assertiveness of the place they occupy in the city, itself a kind of place-making in the sense of a place-taking or an aggressive seizure of place. Another is what I call the work of appearances, of which these images form an intrinsic and intimate part. Now, as the title of this presentation intimates, I situate figuration in direct, if complicated, relation to processes of disfiguration. From the outset, I understand the production and deployment of the Christian images, my main example today of figuration, within the more diffuse crisis in appearances or disfiguring momentum that took hold of Ambon during the conflict and that more generally describes a relatively unstudied, if long acknowledged, aspect of war. Already in the early decades of the 19th century, the Prussian general and military theorist Karl von Clausewitz captured the uncertainty and challenge to perception posed by warfare, noting how, quote, all action takes place, so to speak, in a kind of twilight, which like a fog or moonlight often tends to make things seem grotesque and larger than they really are. With respect to Ambon, it's crucial to realize how indebted the city's images were to a situation of acute crisis, where the world as ordinarily apprehended not only seemed to change its appearance, but even more disturbingly began to relinquish some of the aesthetic forms and visible <coughs> outward appearances that had hitherto held it in place, making it imaginable and livable. Trust in appearances on which much of social life relies, and the taken for grantedness that leaves aesthetic forms broadly conceived, largely unnoticed in everyday circumstances, decline dramatically. It was in response to this crisis that what I call the work on appearances aimed to bestow shape upon a nervous city in profound disarray, or more graphically, a place in the grips of disfiguration. For the Protestant Ambonese who produced the street pictures, these, offer, these offered, I propose, among many other things, a new visible medium through which to figure their own place in precarious times. Through them, they aim to secure the presence of God as the guarantor of their long-standing prominent position in the city. It's quite an elite group, these Protestants. A claim to recognition and even a right to existence and futurity in Indonesia after Suharto. Prior to Ambon's war, God's previously limited or even largely invisible presence suffused the highly contested, if still Christian, dominated city, sufficing as a tacit assurance that he watched over the congregation of the Protestant Church of the Moluccas, the Gay Payam, or the direct descendant of the Dutch colonial Calvinist one. In the midst of the nationwide crises accompanying the Suharto regime's collapse, and their various ramifications across the archipelago, a pressing uncertainty had arisen in its place. 
seen in this light, as I have argued elsewhere, the Christian pictures might also be understood as a case of protesting too much. Now, Orphan Landscapes, the title of the book and also of this presentation, serves as a gloss for the larger predicament of uncertainty, crisis, and rupture, or the orphaned landscapes that issued in the wake of the Suharto regime's collapse and the withdrawal of a leader who styled himself the father of the nation, Indonesia by extension, as one big family, and addressed even his cabinet ministers as children. Across the country, great uncertainty accompanied the long-standing dictator's departure and the downfall of his regime. Writing about the capital of Jakarta, one author, Abedin Kusno, describes a profound sense of a looseness at the center, afflicting city residents, and the feelings of insecurity, vulnerability, and general disorientation that went with it. With the evacuation of power at the nation's center, he writes, it is if a central support that has stabilized the island of Java for ages has been removed. A sense of restlessness prevails among the inhabitants. Now in the book, I tack back and forth between several dimensions of the pervasive national predicament characterizing this initial period after Suharto's withdrawal. From the nation's orphaning or precarity of citizen subjects, bereft of the paternal force that had previously authorized their place, granted them recognition, and orchestrated everyday national appearances to the painted urban gallery of Jesus faces and Christian scenes authored by Protestants affiliated with Ambon's GPM church. Living at risk in the ravaged city and increasingly altered country, it is no exaggeration to say that many among the GPM's congregation felt both figuratively and literally orphaned in relation to their own context of production and activity. Highly ambivalent works, the city's Christian pictures are in some respects just pictures, as good Protestant Ambonese would, not surprisingly, often insist. Or landscapes in the, in the European, more traditional sense of stabilizing a view and offering a perspective on things. But beyond such stability, they may themselves be seen as orphaned landscapes or act affectively charged aesthetic presences shot through with the desire to be seen and therein safeguarded, as well as haunted by the doubt as to whether, indeed, this is the case. <clears throat> now, while it is important to recall how inflected circumstances in Ambon were by the larger national circumstances I just sketched for you, I hone in here on three examples of more localized registers of placemaking. The figures of territory and landscape embedded in place through the street paintings and the performances of their young male motorbike taxi supporters, the enclaving of place exemplified by a private Christian prayer room, and the carving out of a place for the protoplasmic creaturely potential of the nation, that's from Mick Tausig, and therein Indonesia's futurity in public service announcements that depicted children on television who spoke out against violence amidst images of war's ruins. In all three examples of placemaking, I foreground the relationship between images and the environments in which these emerge, with an eye towards problematizing and complicating a connection that all too often is disregarded or understood complacently. Now, all images necessarily enjoy a certain autonomy and excess with respect to their surroundings. And in the words of the marvelous Chris Pinney, cannot just be plucked in any simplistic way and sutured with the sociological and political reality of any particular historical moment, or with what, as it were, presents itself as the most compelling context around. To be sure, the immense energy with which the Christian pictures surfaced in Ambon City and clamored to be seen had everything to do with the devastating conflict in which they came to be. Yet even as there are crucial connections to be made, the pictures neither reflect nor are merely expressive of the war carried out in religion's name or its multiple enabling circumstances, nor can they be reduced to or systematically embedded in any significant circumscribed setting. For that matter, War's Twilight or the Cloak of Fog that Clausewitz von Clausewitz saw as one of its constituting conditions is itself an enabling context for violence that needs to be understood as generated rather than merely assumed. Relatedly, with respect to images, 
the inherently transitory, fragile nature of the associations between any given social reality and the image world to which it somehow provisionally con is conjoined must be recognized as such, that is, as provisional and as something therefore requiring explanation. Now, in the anxious, rapidly changing circumstances of Ambon's war, many of the taken for granted appearances of the everyday urgently and repeatedly called attention to themselves, revealing the inevitable transience and difficulty of keeping in place the forms that hitherto had characterized the city, its inhabitants, and the fabric of its complicated urban everyday. Regarding specifically the images conventionally deployed by Christians, until the war that is, from small scale posters and wall calendars to scenes of the Last Supper inlaid with the Moluccan Islands lustrous mother of pearl and restricted for the most part to Christian interiors, these began to fall short visually of what was expected of them. As a consequence, the long familiar props of Umbrunese Christian homes and stores, so familiar that largely they could be taken for granted and pretty much overlooked, appeared newly out of place. Put otherwise from the perspective of many among this privileged Protestant segment of the urban population in these extraordinary times, the world had itself begun to lose the image that they had long held of it. Those are some of them. Now, of situations of crisis, it is often claimed that the need for art and novel forms of expression becomes enhanced. Elias Kauri, the Lebanese novelist and prominent public intellectual, writes of Beirut's crisis in a way that exposes how the present comes to defy the aesthetic forms of an earlier pre-crisis moment. And I quote him, the present has to be written about, he says, not contextualized in historic historical terms. The present is mute. It cannot be evoked in yesterday's language. Repeatedly, he continues in our interviews, we heard about changes in art and language during and after the Civil War. Now, although little was said about art during my fieldwork in Ambon, it is possible to paraphrase Cowrie's words in a manner that makes them resonate powerfully with this other troubled city at a far remove in most respects from Beirut. Along these lines, I propose in the book that the presence of warfare and rampant, rampant uncertainty was blind in Ambon, enclosed, so to speak, in a kind of twilight, such that made it impossible to evoke through yesterday's pictures. In their stead, huge scaled up public images, refigured in ways that in some poignant sense spoke to the predicament of Ambon's Christians, were made to suffice. Or at least, I argue, this was part of the impulse behind them. From this perspective, it becomes possible to understand Ambon's new pictures littered among war's wreckage around the city as a response of sorts to the significant mutual, mutual orphaning of image and world. The Protestant pictures aiming anxiously to address and shape the world around them and the world perceived as morphing out of the pre-crisis forms and appearances through which it was previously known. Now, to set, to set the scene for placemaking beyond the usurpation of place by the pictures themselves, I offer a brief impression of, the wor of this world or the war-torn urban environment in which the street pictures arose and to which, in certain important respects, they opened up. This was a city dramatically and palpably transformed. The presence of ruins, the no-go areas, divisions, and new obstacles in urban space, the myriad symptoms of crisis, things like faces flitting across chapel walls, blood coursing out of faucets, pineapple jelly congealing into blood, Christians possessed by Muslim spirits and other very disturbing events, not to mention the conflict itself and its many implications. All of these radically reshaped and continue to reshape the appearances that had made Ambon hitherto what it was. Already in the early days of the conflict, barricades sprung up in Ambon streets, inhabitants set up POSCO or communication and command posts at the edges of their neighborhoods. Bullets guard buildings replaced the shiny facades of fish restaurants, coffee houses, gold and souvenir shops that had once lined the city's main arteries, now increasingly littered with the debris of battle and garbage that remained uncollected. 
In the wake of the destruction of Ambun's main market at the onset of the war, the very first days, smaller religiously segregated markets that were literally shocked into existence emerged in their stead, obstructing sidewalks and cluttering streets where the itinerant five-footed vendors of satay, yellow rice, hot tea, and the like began to sell articles previously available only in the city's shopping mall and fancier stores like clothing. For most of its inhabitants, the space of the city shrunk as they became more and more confined to one or another of its increasing, increasingly religiously marked areas. Like some monstrous checkerboard, Ambon morphed rapidly into a vast patchwork of Christian red and Muslim white, issuing in a highly segrega segregated every day with red market, white market, red and white speedboat Ks, red and white pedicabs, red and white minibuses, red and white banks, and so on. At the same time, the city was unmoored in unprecedented ways. Much of its population was on the move, beginning with the forced exodus of the derogatively named Bebe M, short for Bouganese, Bhutanese, and Makassaris, all Muslim migrants in the first days of the war, and the multiple displacements occasioned by the fighting, the destruction and torching of homes and buildings, the refugees fleeing from one part of the city to another, as well as into and out of Ambon from other areas that were affected by conflict as well. As the population dwindled from a pre-war count of around 300,000 to almost half of that towards the end of the war, all kinds of new people also began to arrive to the city. Battalions dispatched by Jakarta to quell the violence, journalists and other media practitioners, NGO activists and humanitarian workers, but also some 2,000 jihadis from Java a good year after the conflict began. Over time, what one priest called new categories of mobility emerged. These comprised, for instance, pedicab drivers and easily mobile others, who as the war dragged on and the city became increasingly rent, began to traffic between the protagonists of the conflict, supplying Muslims, for instance, with vegetables from the city's traditionally Christian hills and Christians with fish from the largely Muslim-controlled coastal areas. Relevant, too, are the motorbike taxi drivers whose numbers increased exponentially in the early to mid-2000s since they could navigate the difficult, segregated terrain of the city more easily than minibuses or any cars. It is to this uncertain, tumultuous, and danger-ridden world that the images I speak of today opened up. But not only as a sense of their advent to public urban space and the adamant publicity they sought in the city's wartime and post-war physical environment. Moving from the interior spaces of Ambonese Protestant homes and stores and dramatically increasing in size had several implications. First, it meant that the canon from which the street pictures tended to be quite faithfully drawn became more directly infused with the concerns of the larger world around them, specifically those of the young Christian men who put them up, but also of the members of the Christian neighborhoods who backed the picture's production and took generally pride in the results, as well as more diffusely many other, especially Protestant Christians in the city. As a result, the Christian canon and the images of which it is composed quite literally opened up an Ambon to embody new things, changing not only in scale and location, but iconographically as well, in ways that inflected the desires, contingencies of place, an immense investment in the taken for granted consensus, taken for granted contours and privileges of a Christian life world on the wane. Secondly, opening the images also meant that many of these same Protestants, but also, for better or for worse, others in the city, opened or were forced to open themselves to these image, images, whether these were experienced as comforting or soothing, terms used by the, some of these Christians, or alternatively, violent and offensive, terms by use by some Muslims. Whereas these implications pertain to Ambon and its religi religiously mixed population in particular, a third implication relates to the changing nature of public space in Indonesia generally after Suharto and its highly contested, open-ended character, described by the Indonesian cultural activist Intan Paramadita as crowded with a visibility contest. Even before the war, albeit in a more muted fashion, some of Ambun's inhabitants, 
notably those whose place in the city was most precarious, armed themselves visually against the potential misdeeds and ill intentions of their neighbors. An anthropologist working in one of Ambun's most impoverished, cramped, and largely illegally settled neighborhoods, according to some illegally, registered a surplus of protective amulets tacked above the doorways of especially migrant Muslim homes, dried seahorses, magical files, and other potent substances. The proliferation of such overt signs of animosity and suspicion are an expression he wrote, and it's David Mearns, who's an Australian anthropologist, um, an expression, the proliferation of these, these, these signs of animosity and suspicion are an expression he wrote of, quote, the dangers of living so close by those who were strangers in significant cultural and social terms. It is not stretching it too much, I believe, to see a strong resonance between this kind of magical gating and the religious gating of Christian neighborhoods via the huge billboards and murals set up at their entrances. These sites, which today accommodate the motorbike taxi stands, were places during the war where the neighborhood watch was, was based, trumpets sounded before battle, and Christians set off bearing images of Christ in mass ambulant prayer sessions that filled Ambon streets. Looming over this terrain, <coughs> Jesus' gigantic glossy face with its adjacent murals simultaneously gated the community and branded it as decidedly Christian. God was her only weapon, Christians would sometimes say, when they spoke to me about the pictures. Much like an amulet, the material presence of God's image seemed to serve the community as a protective, if also quite aggressive, shield. As such, these pictures also posited a direct relationship between the core symbols of the Ambonese Christian community and physical territory, at the same time that they also facilitated an identificatory relay between the martyred male Jesus and the young men who gathered around his images, and through them, a connection to the suffering of the wider community, or at least neighborhood, for which these men and their particular location uh, stood. Now, while the specific designation of these locations as motorbike taxi stands dates from the war, where the bikes flourished, as I said, as substitutes for minibuses and cars, such sites generally enjoy a long history in the archipelago, one that dates at least to Dutch colonial times, in the form of neighborhood guard houses where young men customarily hang. At these potent sites in Ambon, highly territorial versions of community became articulated at the same time as the very idea of community in relation to territoriality became the site of creative exploration and experimentation. Put otherwise, the assertive, strategically placed pictures themselves seemed to depict and perform the larger drama of deterritorialization and social displacement suffered by the city's traditionally privileged Protestants, according to themselves, of course. That's what I said. While Jesus' portrait consistently graces the street pictures, the backdrops to his face vary widely in terms of the orphaned landscapes into which the Christian God is inserted and which he Christianizes by virtue of his presence. The backdrops are highly heterogeneous, displaying a myriad of otherworldly and thisworldly landscapes of possible future Christian habitation, from familiar topi like Gethsemane and Jerusalem to Christ in situ in Ambon. So there you see the um, kind of reproduction of a Dutch Christmas card in the back there. Um, that's another site. That's a prayer niche in a house, and I'll get to that soon. So these are some of the different um, backdrops. This is um, um, Christ, obviously, <laughs> overlooking the Moluccas. Christ overlooking the city um, in flames and exploding. Uh, Christ overlooking um, not Jerusalem, but Ambon from the, from the spot in the city, which is uh, said to be the best place to get the best view of Ambon on tourist brochures. Um, when I asked one of the city's most prolific painters and his supporters what drove them to make these pictures, they replied they did so because they knew he was here, God in situ, watching over Ambun. 
an insistence that I suggest elsewhere covers a doubt. Christ's gigantic face, interchangeable with or a figuration of the phrase, he is here, claims territory for the self, displaces and defaces the Muslim other, and like the graffiti also sprayed on city walls, insults of Jesus and the Prophet Muhammad, references to Muslim power or Muslim pigs, bears within it highly charged figures of territory. Now taken together, the figures of territory and of landscape built into and arising at these defensive neighborhood locations, fed on and were energized by the symbolically charged, dense sociality that converges on the borders, demarcating the city's Christian neighborhoods from the city and the country around them. Nowhere more so than via the young men identified with these places and with their protection, and with masculine performances in which the motorbike figures as a crucial accessory. During the war, they sometimes wore t-shirts with Christ's face on it and Christian bling in the form of large, gaudy gold crosses that grew to immense sizes around motorbikers' necks. Suffice it to say here that there are many such groups of young men around the city, that they compete with each other in a generally convivial way, and that some of them document in photographs the before and after of their embellished motorbike stands, along with scenes of male camaraderie, like young men performing motorbike stunts in front of the billboards and murals. And you can see some of them doing stunts here and there. <coughs> in these pictures from the mid-2000s, male bodies merged with the Christian landscape behind, him, behind them, as in one, this remarkable image in which the erect bike supported by its owner attired in his Christmas best, it was Christmas Day, aligns perfectly with the crucified Christ behind. In these carefully preserved photographs, bikes, bling, and backdrops work as protheses of male bodies in public space, enabling a masculine assertion of public Christianity and an aggressive Christianization of territory in circumstances where many gay PM Christians, but also other Christians, felt themselves not only under siege, but also increasingly bereft of a place in the city and even perhaps in Indonesia itself. It is in light of these general conditions that the commissioning in the aftermath of war by some of the city's more well-to-do Christians of prayer rooms or Christian-themed walls as special places set off from the rest of the home should be understood. One example will suffice. Tucked away in a Christian neighborhood in the hills overlooking the city, the minuscule prayer room in a Protestant minister's home is painted entirely from floor to ceiling. Forming a single unbroken surface, it envelops those who enter the room to pray within a miniature Gethsemane garden. On the far wall that is the room's immediate focus when one enters, Jesus Christ prays in profile against a shiny green background. Although lavishly sprinkled with flowers and boasting luxuriant vegetation, incongruous rock formations, an occasional palm or olive tree, and a few stiff glossy sheep, the remaining three walls in the room are predominantly green. Not a single spot has been overlooked. Even the door to the room Even the door to the room has been painted over to resemble a cave. Now, since the room's decor is also minimal, there's little to distract one's eyes from the painted surroundings, so that these tend to gravitate towards the quiet, silhouetted Jesus bent in prayer. This directionality, along with the shiny seamlessness of the space, may be one reason why the sense of closeness and of being physically held in Christ's hands is one of the room's celebrated effects. The moment we enter the special room, the minister explained, it's as if we are in his hands. There are olive trees painted there, and there's a painting of Jesus praying. And if we open the window, I, painted some green tree I planted some green trees outside. So if we pray with the windows open, one feels as if one is praying in his hands. It happened that in the magazine Gloria, there was a photo of the Garden of Gethsemane with those olive trees. I said, please paint like this. I want a picture for the atmosphere of Gethsemane. Now, to enter this special room is to leave one world behind and be enclosed in another, a Christian elsewhere that bears only an oblique, tenuous connection to the first. The existence and circulation of such Christian elsewheres and sacred sites, or differently those of other religious traditions like Islam, is not in itself remarkable. Adam Becker, religious studies person, 
observes, for instance, how, quote, scripture and Jewish and Christian traditions carry with them a certain geography. And it is natural for Jews and Christians to employ this geography when they occupy those regions it describes. Close quote. Along with this inbuilt portable geography, the religious universality of Christian holy places like Rome or Jerusalem, along with affect-laden sites such as Gethsemane, is one that pushes them beyond any linguistic or geographical particularity, making it difficult for them to be circumscribed within entirely regional, not to mention national geographies. And that's a quote from Faisal Devju. Now, notwithstanding such mobility, what strikes one here is actually the careful hedging of such circulation, the carving out of a cave-like enclosure, and the creation of a miniature Christian enclave cut off from the world outside. In my use of the phrase Christian enclave, I draw on Christiana Brosius's understanding of a visually induced space, or what she calls an enclave gaze, that imports images and perspectives from various ecologies of circulation generating imagined colonies that nest like spaceships on, in her example, the foreign planet India. Now notable in her definition is not only the enclaving gesture, gesture, but also the complete incongruity with the larger world outside, like spaceships indeed arriving to wholly distinct surroundings. Like spaceships too, at least in their common portrayal in popular media, also available in Ambon, such enclaves often signal an attack, or at the very least, a defensive stance towards the foreign environment around them. Now, to a large extent, the defensive attitude exemplified by the miniature Christian enclave is an extension of the experience of war and the siege mentality of many Christians. Besides the gay PM, the charismatic church rock, representative of Christ's ki uh, kingdom, erected a so-called prayer tower non-stop praying that went on for 24 hours a day, for days on end, in what was seen as spiritual warfare waged against the devil. During lulls in the violence, rocks, teams, ventured out while the rest of the city slept to heal the land. Drenching the doorways of gambling dens, karaoke bars, and other sites infected by sin and violence with Christ's purifying blood. Beyond war, the defensive stance on the part of many Christians has also to do with the changing nature and physical transformation of public space in Indonesia. In particular, the enhanced public visibility and publicity of the nation's embattled religious composition from especially the 1990s on, augmented more recently by the intense visibility contest that I mentioned before. Now, Ambon's pictures arose also on the ruins of war, but also in the midst of what scholars describe as a burgeoning public Islam. In the streets of Ambon and across Indonesia, Islam's indisputable public presence registers visibly and audibly in the many mosques being built, the popularity of Quranic reading sessions and typical Muslim fashions, the rise in the number of Indonesian Muslims performing the Hajj, increasingly also at a younger age, the resurgence of Islamic print media, of Islamic film, the development of new forms of dakwah or proselytizing like cyber and cellular dakwah, and the spread of Islamic economic institutions. Or as the gay PM minister with a home prayer room volunteered in the mid-2000s, characterizing the city's new street paintings as a direct parallel, even a counter to this public Islam, it's the same. They, the Muslims, don't make pictures much, but they wear headscarves as their own kind of special characteristic to, sh to show that we are Muslims. Yes, he said, that's what stands out. Now that which also stands out and figures as an invisible backdrop to the Christian pictures in Ambon streets, churches, and, and homes is the very fact then of Muslim presence. In the form of the overwhelming numerical dominance of Muslims in Indonesia, some 90% of the total population, in the public prominence of Islam throughout the large majority of the country, and in the conviction prevalent during the war among many of Ambon's Christians that they were the target of a Muslim-driven genocide. Claiming and proclaiming the city as Christian, the pictures perform God's partisan presence in Ambon. At the same time as they pictorially efface the Muslim, who hovers at the edge of the frame and charges these public pictures effectively. In an article on the colonial backdrops of photographs, Arjuna Potterai writes how the backdrop relevant to understanding a given photograph is twofold. The first is the visible backdrop, and the second, an invisible one a secondary order 
that shapes the interpretation of the intended viewers. In immediate post-war Ambon, against the backdrop of an encroaching public Islam, a religiously inflected war, an urban environment where societal spaces, as well as individual bodies, continue to be marked by the signs of the recent brutality and where violence remained visible, it took little imagination, I suggest, on the part of those who engage these images, Christians that is, to see, as it were, the larger invisible backdrop looming behind. Now, to pray in the miniature Gethsemane Garden is to enter into a kind of tete-a-tete that realizes itself through the embodied mimicry of the painted God's gestures on the part of the person praying and can lead to being swept up in this physical exchange by the incredible sensation that one is caught protectively in his hands. Together with the unbroken seamlessness of the space and the impact of its images, this sensation seems to be an effect of being momentarily suspended and hermetically sealed, spaceship-like, from any outside surroundings. With leafy trees planted immediately outside the prayer room's windows, even the city's invisible backdrop can briefly be held at bay. In its place, a delicate and moving closeness comes to the fore that the minister's wife was at a loss of words to describe. One in which the room's painted backdrop forecloses the invisible one pressing in from the outside, thereby allowing those praying in the foreground to merge tenderly with the affectively powerful Christian scene. Now, while highly condensed in the prayer room, this is a Christian landscape and sense of place that is spread more diffusely throughout the city, carried by the pictures that have arisen in its streets. It is one in which these Ambonese Christians aim to gather a visual world around themselves, hence the frequent emphasis on the public pictures comforting nature, on the need for their multiple large-scale presence, and on their continual reiteration. Itself a material image, this landscape is mediated by a Christian print canon that while formally identified with intimacy and interiority, and as such a long-standing conventional feature of the city's more domestic Christian spaces, had on the war and thereafter been stood on its head. It is worth considering how the picture's prior exclusive association with the more intimate spaces of the Christian everyday may have contributed to their appeal during the war and aftermath of the war. As these images moved out of houses and stores and grew in size, they did not displace the earlier calendars, posters, or em embroidered Last Supper scenes, but merely supplemented them. Given this local trajectory, the pictures may still somewhat retain the promise and buttress the performance of a Christian Ambonese subject as visually construed in familiar, comfortable, and essentially interiorized surroundings, even as these surroundings have been stretched in quite formidable um, new directions. At issue then, in some basic sense, would be a new acute awareness of the subject's emplacement within a field of vision, but that's another part of this story. Now, if the Christian enclave discloses the impulse to figuration as a way of hedging disfiguration or even imagined erasure, a recurrent feature of the public service announcements, PSAs, aired on television during the war and the occasional documentary on the city's violence was a city in ruins or the portrayal of disfiguration itself. In such production, disfiguration came paired with and was set off by the potent figure of the child her photographed and filmed face, or drawings from her hand. For instance, the short documentary Peace Song from 2001 by the Indonesian filmmaker Gara Nugroho opens with children's drawings successively filling the screen while stills of children's faces come in at the end to frame and literally enclose footage excerpted from national news broadcasts that show Muslim ma migrants frantically boarding and scaling the sides of departing boats as these migrants were driven out of Ambon and the destruction of the city's main market, both in the very first days of the war. Here the faces are drawings of children, what the anthropologist, as I said, Mick Taussig calls the protoplasmic creaturely potential of the nation, serve as a kind of cordon sanitaire that contains violence. Somewhat differently, the PSAs commonly carve out miniature child worlds, sort of enclave worlds, in heavily disfigured dare I say, orphaned urban landscapes from which Muslim and Christian child pairs speak out against violence jointly 
Examples include a quite infamous PSA that early on in the war featured the Muslim child Achang and the Christian Obet meeting clandestinely in the empty basement of an abandoned building in war-torn Ambon. There they affirmed their blood brotherhood while condemning the adults who allegedly caused the violence. In blaming adults, the pair also underscores their symbolic orphaning. Or another PSA aired in the immediate post-war years that begins with a panorama of Ambon City and female Muslim and Christian civil servants walking hand in hand. It is followed then by a scene of traditional dance, captioned Pela Gandonge, indexing the central Malacca's famous interreligious blood brother alliances that often provided a motto for the city's multiple um, reconciliation ritual. At the ad's core is the barest of scenes, a Muslim girl with a headscarf and a Christian boy stand side by side in a tiny ruined space. Without a word, they turn stiffly to each other, shake hands in a gesture that recalls both the long arm of Indonesian state bureaucracy and the numerous handshakes of reconciliation depicted in print and electronic media. Together they unfold and hold up a sign that reads in a faint childish scrawl, I heart Ambon Manise or Sweet Ambon in English. Now powerful figures of redemption, Christ and the child emerged again and again in the ruined, disfigured landscapes of Ambon's drawn out war. Christ in Ambon assumed a markedly partisan guise. Even if following Christian theology, he is held to have sacrificed himself for the whole of mankind. By contrast, the child was inevitably paired in an interreligious Muslim Christian version of we too form a multitude, the multitude authorized and circumscribed by the Indonesian state. But I would like to conclude, not with Ambon today, but with a different example from, drawn not from Indonesia, but from Venezuela. An example of an equally desperate turn to figuration amidst rampant crisis and violence. In January 2014, in the capital Caracas and elsewhere in the country, I was amazed to hear former President Hugo Chavez's voice emanating from television screens and radios in bars, government offices, grocery stores, and other sites uh, that month as well. That same month, he was appointed president for life of the country's ruling party, and most uncannily, his disembodied paired eyes were depicted, often in multiples, against different colored backdrops representing Venezuela's main political parties, including that of the opposition, on huge billboards along highways in downtown Caracas and in other public places. All of these traces of the Bolivarian leader emerged post-mortem, not even a year after Chavez died. In a world in which images increasingly lead the way in politics and social life, a world increasingly troubled by warfare, violence, and rising inequality, it is crucial, as I hope to have shown today, to think the relationship between projects of figuration and the myriad disfigurations of our current times, or more radically even to think the community to come in the absence of any figure that presupposes a bounding, a totality, and the myriad enmities to enable and keep those in place. Thank you. <laughs>